This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And the team and I are on a little vacation until November the 13th when we'll bring you again an original self-work podcast. But I went through the first 100 podcasts and picked either ones that were some of my own personal favorites or ones that are really very how-to. And we'll actually bring you two of them a week, always with the idea of reaching out to those of you who are already comfortable with psychological and emotional issues, perhaps you're in therapy, to those of you who've just been diagnosed with something and you're looking for answers, or for those of you who wouldn't darken the door of a therapist's office, but you might just be curious enough to listen to a podcast like Self Work. So here's the rundown. The first will be Tina Turner takes a seat, and that's all about me, actually. I'm Tina Turner, (laughs) although that's a little bit hard to believe. But it's all about handling aging gracefully. The next is how to learn from a mistake, and there's some very basic tips I give you there. Then another how-to the day before Halloween, three very practical exercises to increase your self-esteem. If you've been listening to self-work for a while, you know I'm all about what you can do about it. And so this gets very specific. On the anniversary of Perfectly Hidden Depression coming out, I pulled a podcast about answering your questions about Perfectly Hidden Depression, and they were great questions. I can't believe the book's been out a year. The next is the day of the election, and I decided to republish an episode called Kindness Matters. I'm remembering someone in this episode who was very kind to me during a particularly chaotic part of my life. The next is another how-to, how to become an emotional grown-up. And many of you have told me that this particular episode really applied to you and your life. And then the last is right before we come back on, all about the victim-savior relationship. A lot of you wanted to know more about that when I recorded the Trauma Bond podcast just a few weeks ago, so I decided to pull it back up for you. So I hope you enjoy listening to these podcasts again. We'll be back with fresh shows on November the 13th, but we're having a little bit of rest and vacay, as they say. (laughs) But before I sign off, I would like you to hear this offer from BetterHelp a sponsor of the Self Work Podcast, and who I'm delighted to have on board. They've got a special offer for you. When I was approached by BetterHelp now several months ago, COVID hadn't emerged, and I'd maybe conducted a handful of telehealth sessions, mostly when someone was sick and couldn't make it into the office. Now, five months later, I'm even more of a believer in telehealth. It took some getting used to, but actually, clients sometimes seem more relaxed. It fits better into their schedule, and although many have told me they miss seeing me in person, it's still been a very fulfilling relationship. I've even started new patients, and they've told me they had positive experiences, so we've never actually met in person. BetterHelp is rated the number one online therapy service that's available to you wherever you live. Confidential and highly personalized It's much less expensive than normal talk therapy. You can text, have video chats, or just talk on the phone. You outline what you're looking for, and BetterHelp suggests several therapist options for you. If you don't seem to find a way to connect with one, they'll ask you more about what you're looking for and then suggest others. I, of course, tried it out before I was going to recommend it to you, and the two therapists I had sessions with listened well and made great suggestions for me, and one said, actually... I might make myself. I talked about my own panic disorder and a very scary situation I'd been through, and they were caring and thoughtful. And I was amazed at how easy it was to get in touch with them to make time changes, for example. Although BetterHelp can't be there in emergencies, nor could any online provider, they have all kinds of information about what you can do in that special circumstance. 
And today, BetterHelp has a great savings offer for you. If you use the link trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork, again, that's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork, you can enjoy a 10% discount on your first month of sessions. After five months of seeing how people relate to telehealth, I'd highly recommend it. If self-work has helped you, maybe better help can give you an even more personal experience with therapy. And so, now we'll focus on the topic of the day. Take care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and I'll see you November the 13th. We've got lots of information to cover today, as the topic, I think, is one that we all can relate to. So what are we talking about? We're talking about if you're as grown up as you think you are. And what I mean by that is how connected are you still to the strategies you used as a child to cope with your family situation or to even survive your family situation? Are you still using those same strategies you used when you were 8 or 11 or 13? Or is how you're coping with life more geared to the actual present, to actual reality? I'll explore more of what I mean. First, I'll come up with a definition of strategy, and then we'll work on how you recognize how you came up with the strategy you're using. Third, we're going to talk about what happens if you don't change strategies and how to know if you have or you haven't. A big clue there, just in case you want to know, is that usually you have over or under reactions to things, and that's a real clue you haven't changed strategies. Number four is all about what I love to talk about, which is what can you do about it? So we'll talk about how you change that strategy in order for it to fit your present day situation. Then as in all episodes, I'm going to read a listener email and respond to it. This one's on post-traumatic stress disorder and the treatment for that. She also wants to know about the importance of the relationship with her therapist. What do I mean when I say, are you really as grown up as you think you are? Some of us may have lucked out and gotten great parents who had lots of integrity. They knew how to love, discipline, and guide without being manipulative or cruel. But many of us did not get that kind of parent Perhaps, in fact, we struggle as parents ourselves. So when you were a child in that family, you began figuring out what's really going on in this family and how can I manage? How can I survive? The problems themselves could be varied. Perhaps one or both of your parents were alcoholics. Perhaps they coddled you and spoiled you. They were helicopter parents. Maybe you were pushed to achieve. Maybe your, one of your parents disappeared or you were born into poverty, there could be lots and lots of different kinds of problems, but children come up with their own unique ways of handling it, their quote-unquote strategies. When you think about it, coaches have strategies. They approach a game like, okay, how can I best win? How can I come out with the outcome that I'll feel better? You see strategies in sports. You see strategies in business. Moms and dads have their own strategies about how are we going to raise our children. It gives you a roadmap, something to follow. A strategy gives you a guide. So even children at a very young age begin to discover what works or doesn't work for them in their family. So let's take a second for you to remember yourself as a child, how it felt to be you. What did you try to do to feel loved, secure, or safe? What kind of role did you play? I had a patient one time, let's call her Diane, who had a very alcoholic father, and her job was to make him laugh so he wouldn't be so mean. And guess who she was as an adult? She always used humor to hide the pain that she felt. And by the way, she was obese and diabetic. We talked a lot about how she was using this strategy in her present day life, and it wasn't working for her. Perhaps you had parents who withheld their approval, so you got a job at 11 years old or 12 years old trying to get that approval. Maybe you tried to stay invisible if you had alcoholic or drug-abusing parents. 
Maybe if there was a lot of anger and fighting in your home, you got totally involved with football or student government or something so you wouldn't have to go home. There are lots of different kinds of strategies that kids come up with. They're not really conscious. You weren't conscious as a child of what you were doing. Oh, this is my strategy. You were just doing it because it worked, or at least you believed it worked. And then those strategies led you to have beliefs that you formed about yourself. Maybe it was, I'm not worth being loved, or I have to be the best. My job is to take care of others. You came up with a belief system based on how your parents responded to your strategy. You know, let's talk again about the kid who maybe gets a job at 11 or 12. In a healthier family, there would be a discussion about, well, what does that mean? And are you really ready for this? How will it affect your schoolwork? In a not-so-healthy family, one in which a child was trying to get approval, it may be that the parent derided the child for getting a job or didn't notice, but there was no discussion. I worked with a man one time who was a very, very successful uh, manager and a corporate guy, and his father had told him over and over again, you're never going to amount to anything. So guess what his strategy was? I'll be successful no matter what. But what that looked like in the present day was that he was a terrible workaholic. He had made millions. And what he really wanted to do was to stop and do some nonprofit work, dedicate his life to a purpose bigger than himself. He had had no children with his wife. And yet he looked at me with a lot of vulnerability and said, I can't stop. I know that I'm still trying to prove my dad wrong, but I don't know how to change my strategy. Many of us don't change our strategies. My particular one, when I was a kid, I was highly overprotected. The reason was that I was not all that healthy physically, but I always felt like I could do more. I felt like in some ways, my parents didn't really want me to do more and used me being physically ill as a reason to not support me. So guess what my strategy was? I did things, volunteered for things, tried out for things, and didn't really ask. I just did it and then told them, well, I got in the play or my piano teacher had given me a new piece to learn and I really wanted to work hard on it. I was always pushing myself. So guess what? As an adult, what did I keep on doing? I kept on pushing myself to the point that at times I wasn't making healthy decisions. I wasn't thinking about the true damage that could be done to me. When I realized that I was using the same old strategy that may have gotten me through as a child, I began to think more clearly. Up until that point, in some ways, I hadn't really grown up. So take a minute and think about what was going on in your family, good or bad, that you came up with a strategy, you came up with a plan, you came up with a guide again, not intentionally, to somehow survive, to do well, to succeed in that family. You could maybe take some time even to write these things down, write three or four things down that you know that you tried to do in order to either avoid harm, be successful, or just get what you need. Now that you've taken some time to have that insight, Look around your life like I tried to do and realize, wait a minute, where am I using those strategies and does it work for me now? Two huge clues that can help you see that perhaps the strategy you're using doesn't fit your reality now is if you have a major underreaction or a major overreaction to something. And I mean those over and underreactions as emotional reactions. Or perhaps, as as I say, if it's an underreaction, it would be the lack of emotion. Both of those are, like I said, huge clues that tell you there's a childhood strategy, a childhood belief that's getting triggered. Let's talk about some examples. Let's say as a child, you were taught that you should not ever show pain. Maybe you had a parent or a grandparent die, and you were never allowed to talk about it. Now, in the present, you have a miscarriage at four or five months, or your partner does, and there's no grief. There's no sadness. 
you're underreacting to something that is very sad, but you still believe, you still have the strategy that you're not supposed to grieve. You're not supposed to show that sadness. Now let's give an example of an overreaction. Let's say your role in your family was to be the family protector. You had a dysfunctional parent of some kind who had an extremely bad temper and would really cause home life to be miserable. And you, kind of like uh, Diane was in her role with humor, your role was to protect your siblings. You may have even taken some abuse for them. So now you're at a party and someone gets really drunk or is highly rude. Your overreaction because your childhood strategy is getting triggered, maybe to believe that you've got to solve this problem. You've got to get this person who's out of control in control, and it's your job and nobody else's. Now, again, that may be something that is helpful. And yet, if you're being triggered by your old role, you won't see other things that are going on in the present in your reality that add to the picture of what you should do. You'll be blind to those things because you will be motivated by the strategy that you've used all your life. Again, to make the point, you will be grown up because you will see that your motivation will be connected in a very real way to what's really going on in the present. So now I'd like you to do a little bit of thinking, maybe some writing if you can, about what are those things that you have over and under reactions to that maybe your friends say, why do you get so mad about that? Or have you ever considered doing something about that rather than being so passive? The things that people who love you see that you're struggling with, you're either over or under reacting. It can be kind of neat to realize that you could do something about that if you really wanted to. Another woman that I worked with several years ago is coming to mind. Her basic childhood strategy was to stay invisible. She had a fairly violent home, and so she would go to her room whenever her father or her mother came home from work. Well, guess what? (laughs) She married somebody that was fairly passive, and she kept on being invisible in her world. She was a highly functioning person, but she turned down jobs that would put her in the limelight. She was always very giving with others, but she never wanted the spotlight. She never wanted the attention to be put on her. She was still being governed by a pattern of behavior that she had learned would help her survive as a child. We talked about this a lot. She came in smiling one day and said, Well, I've done something I never thought I'd do. And I said, What was that? She said, It was my birthday last week, and I put balloons on the mailbox just for me. I've always done it for my kids. I've always done it for my husband. But I never did it for me because I didn't want to call attention to the fact that it was my birthday. She laughed. She said, it's such a small thing, but it's such a huge thing. That brings me to the fourth point about what you can do about it. Once you've identified these strategies, and of course you can try to determine, is the strategy still helpful? It may be that it could be. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But if it's keeping you stuck, keeping you paralyzed, keeping you underreacting or overreacting, to things in your environment, in your family, with your friends, at your work. You can begin to unhook and believe that you can live your life and be governed by a different strategy. You have to confront the one you're using and decide, you know, I just don't want to do this anymore. What happens then? This is definitely what comes from what you can do about it. You feel hopeful. Insight is a great thing. Insight helps us understand context, understand our history, make connections, see patterns. Insight is very valuable. And yet from what I've learned for over 20 years and the wonderful patients I've seen, hope doesn't come from insight. Hope comes from changing your behavior, or as we're putting it in this particular podcast, growing up. There's one thing I want to point out here. I'm a therapist. I believe in therapy. I'm a therapist actually because I got good therapy. But you don't always have to come into therapy to make these kinds of changes. 
You can sit down with an old friend or a sibling, perhaps, and you can ask them what they noticed about how you handled whatever pain was in your family. You can do the same for them if they want, but talk to somebody who knows you from the past, who says, oh yeah, your family fought all the time, and and what I saw was you trying to mediate between your parents, like you became an adult in your own family when you were only eight or nine years old. So again, trying to see if you're using that strategy now, when do you play, or do you always stay in your adult problem-solving, mediating pattern? You don't have to do that. You can put balloons on your mailbox, even when your strategy has been to stay invisible. So today we've been talking about strategies, strategies you came up with unintentionally, unconsciously as a child, and might still be active in your present. To recognize those strategies, sometimes with the help of a therapist or a longtime friend, changing those strategies so that you're not an underreactor or an overreactor, but are truly present in the moment and are guided by who you are now, not who you were then. That's what I mean by feeling truly grown up. So now I'm going to read an email from a listener that I got, oh, maybe a month or so ago. Here we go. Okay, I can't get this off my mind, so I'm going to write you about it. I listened to your post on shame, and that's me. I have so much shame and have turned my emotions off for so long that I no longer know how to tap into them or feel them. I can count on one hand how many times in the last 10 years I've cried. The day my husband and I got married and the moment I saw my daughter after giving birth. I'm so frustrated with myself. I want to feel I need to cry, but I can't. How in the world do I move beyond the mental block I have toward feeling? Here's my response. There are many factors that could be important here. If you're on antidepressants, they can mute emotional response. If not, then it could be a trust issue or a belief about vulnerability. The clue you give is shame. If you're shaming yourself, that is an emotion, but a paralyzing one. It can convince you you're not worthy of allowing yourself other emotions, especially happy or positive ones. There's a wonderful book, Healing the Shame That Binds You, You could try reading that. Of course, finding a good therapist can help. If you have trauma, someone who can do EMDR is a good idea. EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. It's been shown to be excellent with trauma. So she writes back, I'm on antidepressants, but this was an issue even before I got on them, and I trust my therapist. She actually just went through EMDR training. I have an extensive history of childhood trauma, and I have PTSD from trauma experienced as an adult. The feelings of shame and guilt are so prevalent in my everyday life. I have a successful job in marketing. I'm married and I have a beautiful two-and-a-half-year-old little girl. I smile and fake it, but when I'm alone, the anxiety and fear consume me. The nightmares and flashbacks overwhelm me. So when I got back with her the second time, I said that obviously she needs to work on these nightmares and flashbacks. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, can be a terrifically difficult disorder to have because it can interject itself so suddenly and explosively into your life. So if you have PTSD of any kind, whether it's about acute trauma, something that happened literally last month or a week ago, or you have chronic trauma, then seeking help is really, really important. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Self Work. You can reach me lots of different ways. I do write a blog where I post weekly. It has the original name of drmargaretrutherford.com. You can email me and I'll answer your email. It is confidential, by the way. It's askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Some of you have written in and told me you're enjoying the podcast. I really appreciate that so much. In fact, on that topic, I would love it and so appreciate it if you would leave a rating or write a review, especially in iTunes. That's really important. Plus, it gives me some feedback about what you like or even in your review if you said something that you'd really like to see improved. I like that feedback as well. And of course... I really love to see that subscriptions are rising and hope you'll be one of my subscribers. Thanks so much. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, and you've been listening to Self Work.